wants to sit down. If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. If you can hear me, clap three times. All right. This is a very echoey groom. Uh, let's get the first six rows all filled up. I want to see shiny, happy faces. We've got some, some loneliness going on up here. <laughs> Come on, guys, in the back. Let's all move up. Let's all be together. Yeah. All right, I wasn't quite ready to get started, but I guess we will. All right. Okay, so we're starting, so everyone's going to stop talking. Lovely. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Chelsea Rustrum, and I started Blockchain for Good. <laughs> Yay! I also run a blockchain marketing agency and a, a new economy storytelling company called Block7. So if you have any needs for that, please get in touch with me on that basis. Um, I'm very excited for this conversation tonight. It should be really interesting and engaging, hopefully all in good ways and in loving, peaceful ways. <laughs> um, so yeah, so let's see, what do we got going on? We've got to thank the space, so SAP. Where's Tom? Tom, are you here? Come say hi. Come on. Tell us about what's going on in this space and why we're here. Hi, we are SAPIO. We are a startup incubator. We host uh, and fund external startups um, as well as internal startups from around SAP, which uh, is one of the biggest software companies in the world, if you don't know it, um, but we focus mostly on enterprise. Uh, so that's us. Welcome to the space, and let's have a great night. Yeah, and thank you, big hand, for providing the space and drinks, and also for Coral for sponsoring drinks and this amazing camera and the live stream. So anybody that's watching, please thank Coral. Uh, and John's going to come up and tell us a little bit about Coral. They're the main sponsor. Hey, everybody. I am John Gillen. I'm one of the co-founders and head of business development at Coral Protocol. As a lot of you know, uh, phishing on the blockchain is a massive problem. Nearly $9 million a day are stolen uh, for Whoa. phishing scams. And so what we've done at Coral is we've created a de decentralized security protocol that plugs into wallets, exchanges, and dApps uh, in order to stop phishing in its tracks. Uh, we collect evidence of fraud on the blockchain and can tell uh, existing fraud and also predict un yet unknown fraud to prevent uh, users of blockchain platforms from losing their money. Uh, so if you guys have uh, wallets, exchanges, or platforms where you send or receive money, we should uh, work together. Thanks. You should probably know John. Good evening. So we're going to do a about 10 minute foundational talk by Daisy. D Daisy Ozum, am I saying that right? Ozum, like awesome. I'm sorry. And they'll actually be introducing themselves. And then we'll do a Q&A with the audience and kind of get more discussion going. And then if there's any announcements that anybody wants to make about their company or an organization or something that they're working on, there's time to do that as well. And I also just want to uh, offer that I started Blockchain for Good actually because I feel like we need an ethical narrative when it comes to the technology that we're creating and we need to really be thinking about what, what values we're programming into the future. And so that's the basis of this organization. It also exists in New York City and we're, we're using Meetup Pro so we're going to start building these out in other cities as well. So if you know people in, say, Boulder, Austin, or Los Angeles, those are the next cities we're targeting, who might want to host a group like this, that would be an amazing introduction. So with that, Daisy, I'd love to hear your foundational talk, because it's going to be great. Okay, thank you. 
course. Hi everyone, um, it's nice to meet you tonight. So before we even jump into this talk, because it's a, it's a very, like this? Can you hear me? Okay, no, sorry. Um, okay, I usually don't have that problem. So, um, right, so tonight we're gonna be talking about a topic that is very sensitive, right? And for some folks, it may make them, make them very uncomfortable. Um, if you've never been exposed to this kind of information before, but I really wanna get us grounded and centered, right, and open to receiving this information tonight. Is that okay? Okay, so I'm gonna just run us through, how about we do um, about maybe like three quick breaths, okay? With each other, so in through the nose. Let's hold it. I'll be a horrible meditation teacher. Okay, another. Yeah, one more. Okay. All right, so some of you are like, who is this girl with the headscarf? Um, my name is Daisy Ilzem, and I do a lot of work in the blockchain space in terms of like social entrepreneurship. Um, I came from doing a lot of work in San Francisco and public health, politics, whatnot, and I have personally been impacted by this issue of colonization um, because my family is from Nigeria, and my mom came here to this country to flee the impacts of colonization um, in her country, well, in our country. And I also went to high school back home there too, so I saw the first-hand impacts of the legacy of this system. So um, just to kind of give a little bit of background, when I saw this event online, I was like, hold on, wait a minute. You're talking about colonization? Let me put my hand up in it because it's a very, yes, this is a very critical topic that needs to be discussed and I feel like we call it so many different things, but the real issue that we're dealing with right now in this society is colonization and the legacy of it, right? So I really want folks, like I said, we did the breathing exercise. This is not about the blame game, right? This is not about you feeling targeted or um, attacked. This is about for us being able to listen because we've all been impacted by colonization so we can start to change our behavior and the way we view things in society, okay? And especially because blockchain, I heard someone say earlier, can be the great equalizer. It can, but if we don't change our perspective, that's not gonna happen. It's gonna create a new form of oppression, okay? <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Okay, this is better. Thank you so much. So, all right. So, what is colonialism, right? So, colonialism was. It happened many years ago, but we're still dealing with the impacts today, right? But colonialism really is the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial political, social, and economic control of another country, occupying it with settlers, and exploiting it economically, right? So when we think about that, we're like, okay, well, how is that happening today? Let's talk about this. But before I even go into that, I want to talk about what colonialism created, because we talk about things like capitalism, we talk about things like racism, the military industrial.
right? So there's a lot of these different countries that we turn on the TV, we see little kids running around with swollen bellies and no shoes and whatnot, and we think, wow, let me go ahead and donate. These countries are very resource rich. They are just being pillaged, right? And this is because of the legacy of colonialism. That's why they came in the first place, right? And then the last characteristic of colonialism was, you see a man, he's there preaching to some enslaved Africans who are chained. The beauty, why a lot of people of color feel like they need to go get blonde hair and blue eyes, right? It's a lot of the different foods that we eat. It's a lot of the different cultures that we engage in, what we consider to be um, cool, things like that. And it's happening again, right? Um, I just want to kind of give an example. Things like yoga, these different holistic practices, they all came from indigenous people. But because we were colonized, a lot of peoples of indigenous people, we shy away from those practices. Oh, that's bad. That's the devil, ETC, right? And then we see a whole wave of people running towards enlightenment, yoga, all these different things. But there's a whole group of people left out. And why is that? because we've been systematically trained to not want to actually engage in those cultures, right? We've been systematically trained by fear and by violence to not engage in those type of things. We need to think about that too. And America is like the main colonizer right now. And we call it globalization. And we go to all these different countries and we kind of spread our situation, <laughs> right? And then we turn around and we wonder why things are happening that the, the way they are happening. When I lived in Africa, People love McDonald's. I was like, this is trash. I can go, I used to go to school every single day after school and eat this. They're like, wow, tell us more. Right? But it's the American culture where basically it's the colonial culture where basically the dominant culture gets to set what the standard is. They get to set what is good, what's cool, right? So th those are just some of the main characteristics of colonialism. Let's look about it in the past, because some folks are like, okay, this happened so long ago. How does it translate into today? Well, in the past, it was depletion of resources through violence. And we're not talking about, oh, it happened one time and they left. We're talking about every single day for hundreds of years. And elimination of cultures through religious domination, right? We have things like, we, you guys remember the Salem witch trials, stuff like that, right? They did that in several countries. Um, I remember my grandmother, she was, she's like the last person to actually hold our indigenous culture called Odinani. My mom and all her siblings are all Catholic, but they suffered just to hold on to that culture, right? Because when the Catholics came in, there's none of that. It's double worship, right? Expansion of empire through forced and slave labor, right? A lot of the reason why France, British Columbia, uh, Britain, um, all these other European countries, the only reason why they have any wealth is because they went to those other countries and stole it from them. Right? Accumulation of generational wealth through violence. So there's some folks, maybe even folks sitting in this room, you have an endowment passed down from one generation to another of wealth. And that's because your ancestors, right, they were able to get that wealth through these different tactics. And are we saying you're to blame? No. But you need to recognize that, right, and do something to make amends for that history. Lastly, it's enforcement of the colonial structure through enforcement of the colonial legal system. So a lot of these different um, cultures, they have their own systems of governance. They have their own system of judgment. They have their own system of market, of trade, all of that. And when the colonial powers came in, all of that was done. We're setting up our own court. So whatever you have going on here, you, ad you address us now. And that was literally how it was, right? And this is a lot of history we don't learn in school. We celebrate all these different people, colonizers, Columbus, whatnot, but these people were creating a lot of harm and damage, right, that a lot of people are still dealing with till this day. It's called intergenerational trauma. What does colonialism look like in 2018? It looks like gentrification, right? People being pushed out of their homes, out of their communities, out of their neighborhoods. People coming into their communities, calling the police because of whatever, right? Oh, we need to beautify this. Oh, now you need a license if you want to go into the park that I grew up in, right? That looks like demonization and commodification of indigenous transformative cultures. We, I just gave you the whole yoga example, right? Herbalism, people going on these ayahuasca trips, don't even know what you are doing, <laughs> right? Hiring bias, and what does that have to do with colonialism? That's a way for economic control. People don't even know subconsciously what that's doing. 
and we see the statistics, whole classes of people get left out, right? That looks like st state-sanctioned, racially-based violence. What does it mean, state-sanctioned violence? It means the state is enforcing this violence against my body because I am a certain skin color, I'm a certain gender. And sometimes it's not even, oh, the police, you know, they killed somebody. Sometimes it's school-to-prison pipeline where they give kids a test in the third grade dictating how many beds they're gonna build in prisons. That's a real test, that's real. I used to work in elementary school, right? Generational disenfranchisement through charity. Why are we donating? Why are we not giving these folks the tools to rebuild their cultures and their, econ their economies and their society? Why do we need them to be dependent upon us? There's a really good book called Dead Aid that we all should be reading and it talks about this dynamic, right? Start giving people the tools to rebuild and be self-sufficient. No more of this writing grants and having to beg and fundraise and all of that. It's colonial, right? It's the savior mentality. And, and is lack of representation of colonized peoples in critical decision making. Okay, we see the presidency, wow, there's no women. That's been happening. People are always talking about Donald, that's been happening. As oppressed peoples, I'm not surprised and I'm not worried because our ancestors been through this before, right? But this also looks like in companies, right? All the board and the CEO, no people of color, no women, right? And because of that, it's because of that homogenous makeup, you really miss critical, right, and transformative opportunities to make your company something greater than it already is, right? So when we talk about diversity and inclusion, it's not about you just giving me a little job in tech so I can be traumatized, because that's what's gonna end up happening, <laughs> right? It's about how do we even diversify who gets access to the training? How do we even diversify who gets to open these companies? How do we diversify decision making so that people who are most impacted, right, by our failed decisions, get to have a seat at the table, right? Thinking about policy, for instance. I don't know if you all ever heard the, um, the SESTA policy that they just passed, which eliminated uh, the ability for sex workers, right, to go and um, do their business online. I live in Oakland, right off 23rd and International, AKA the, you know what? The day that they passed that policy, the next day all those women were out there working, right? because of one flip switch that was flipped on the internet. Had they been involved in the policy and decision making process, do you think it would have went down like that? No, because they would have told you, we have, yeah, I know you don't want me to do this, but this is how I live. So this is how you can transition me out of this system, right? That's what we're talking about by colonialism, right? So, now, how do we move past this? Now that I've kind of given you what has been going on for the past 2,000 some odd years, I guess. When did Christopher Columbus, that was like 600 years ago? Something like that. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, right, colonialism was born out of a scarcity and fear mentality. Because if you were content with what you had, right, if you didn't have this inflated sense of grandeur, you did not have to get on a ship and sail across the ocean and go to someone else's land and start terrorizing. You wouldn't have to do that. Something your right mind would have told you, I have enough here, let's build here, right? Then it birthed a system that created racism, capitalism, and gender-based violence. In order to end colonialism, we have to address how it manifests through our behaviors, okay? It's hard, but this is the best thing that you can do for yourself because colonialism at the end of the day is an existential crisis, okay? So with that being said, this concludes my presentation. on now yeah it's on now wow yeah amazing thank you daisy so so important she uh daisy chased me down she's like you're doing this talk and rah, 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 like <laughs> 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 and the funny thing is is like i was i was building up to asking her to do a foundational talk of some sort and i was like okay let's get on the phone and yeah we worked it out and i'm so so grateful that you're here and that you could give us a feeling sense and a logistical sense of what's happened and maybe how we might move forward. So with that, let's introduce the panel. So we've got Ben and, yeah? Yeah. One of the things that Daisy has taught me yeah. is that trauma that she 
he had on the screen was not about 1492. No. It's about today. Of course. And my experience is that those traumas live in our bodies <coughs> and they live in our health. So, I mean, sit with that. Like, where is it that um, we can raise our own consciousness so that there's a different way that we think about ourselves and each other and how that's happened to many of us for different reasons, whether it's the Me Too movement or the colonization that happens because stupid white people go to other countries. Whatever it is, I just feel that it's really important to acknowledge that um, that we're waking up yeah. and that we're starting to know yeah. about this. Thank you. I feel like it's also an intergenerational trauma. I mean, it's more so a trauma for the people that were affected, but it's a trauma for all of us. Like, it's a trauma that we don't, we don't know where we came from, most of us. We don't know where our families came from. We don't know our family history. And I feel like that leads into the whole thing, because we're just like, well, yeah, my family is somewhere from Europe, and there's something, something that happened, and they came over, right? Um, there's a lot of something, somethings in there that weren't great. There's <laughs> also yeah. a lot of detail that affects everybody. A lot of what? It's like DK that affects everybody. DK. Yeah, it affects society as a whole. Yeah. All of us. So, so if you want to do it, at least do it from a selfish perspective. Not only to make things right, or to, but everybody will do better that way. What do you mean by a selfish perspective? If, if nothing else, even if you have no compassion or sympathy for anybody else who might have gone through that, it affects you and your everyday life. So even if you're a complete racist who doesn't give a damn about any of these, you should still care and change some of these things because it does affect you eventually. Well, we're all connected, right? I mean, at least that's what I believe. I don't know if everybody else believes that, but I believe that what impacts me impacts you. Um, what is that quote I just saw the other day? It's like, enlightenment is when a wave realizes it's the ocean, right? So anyway, with that, let's introduce the panel. We've got, we've got Ben and Anastasia and Saya, and we'll do, we'll do more like open dialogue in a minute, but first let's do this. Uh, combo with these three lovely individuals. Um, cool. Is it on? Yes. How's everybody feeling? Do we want to take another deep breath? I feel like I do. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Daisy. It, said a it was a keynote. Uh, it was just an opening. So For me, much, it was a keynote. So much Thank passion you. in all the right ways. Yeah. 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 Okay. Do you want us to introduce ourselves? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, let's do so, that. Hi. I'm Anastasia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm super happy to be here. Um, yes, I call myself a mompreneur, right? But I started as a, as a social entrepreneur when I became a mother. My whole world collapsed and I had to rebuild it from the ground on a, in a new, more powerful and a better structured way. Uh, so now I'm a mompreneur. I launch startups and I advise. I got always involved into cutting edge technologies. Ten years ago, it was uh, online sales of handmade goods. Then it was AR and VR. Now it's blockchain and AI. But uh, the main focus has been always how we create something ethically. And I have an MBA, and it's just easier for me to think about it from a business perspective. So the question I wanted to pose to the panel, and in, in addition to introducing themselves, is. What brought you to this conversation? Like, why are you interested in this specific? There you go. So thank you. Thanks, Fossi. Yeah. Um, well, I've been doing some advising in, in the ICO space, and then uh, a colleague of mine, we wrote a beautiful proposal for uh, UN, and we're very inspired. And then more I was in the space of blockchain for good, I understood that it wasn't that much of a good in there, that it was, again, exploiting and colonizing, literally. And I have arguments, and I, I'm happy to share later. So when I was talking to Chelsea, I was like, man, that bothers me so much, because we're doing, again, the same shake over and over, and we're just not 
not mindful enough. And it's going to bite us back. So she was like, oh, let's create a panel. I'm like, okay, let's do it. So, but it, it's a personal thing to me. I have a child and I really want to see a better, a different world. And I know it is possible. So that's what I want to bring awareness. Yes, Saya. Hi, I'm Saya. And so I am originally an educator. I actually grew up uh, not in the US. I grew up in Myanmar. And a lot of where I come from is come from a mix of design and education. And so tech wasn't my origins. It was really about understanding how our systems built up and how do we help people get through these systems and like you know how do we build the funnels that get people from point A to B uh, because it's not even a conversation about blockchain there is a lot of inequalities in whatever is existing right now and so how that's ended up well how I've ended up in blockchain is because as I was learning more about it there's a lot of complexity involved and at this point in history knowledge is power and knowledge is access, and a lot of the time, knowledge is also the biggest barrier for change. And so that's where I started, in helping people understand what blockchain is, and how do you get people through the funnel so that they can start making the decisions themselves uh, of, is this something that I'm interested in, pursue it? If not, all right, now I know about it. Um, and a really foundational thing that I like to think about is when the founding fathers and Daisy talked about like she really hit the nail on the head of like these systems these structural systems when the founding fathers founded America you know who was at the table it was pretty much like old white men British imperial politics and that's a system that we're still struggling to change hundreds of years later and so designing a system is always easy uh, but changing it what's in, once it's implemented is a lot harder. And so I think at this point in time in blockchain, we're at a place where people who have the knowledge, the wealth, the media attention, the power are designing the system, but are they designing in accordance to what the world needs? And if so, what are the responsibilities that we have to open that up and also empower others? That's where I'm really coming from in this conversation. And so I'm really excited to be here. Um, and yeah, talk more. Thank you. Thanks, Saya. <laughs> ben? Check, mic check. Mic check, hello? Check, check. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you, thank you guys. Uh, Chelsea, thank you for having me here. It's such an honor. Uh, it's been in the room with such beautiful people here, such open hearts. Uh, my name is Ben Bartlett, and I'm the Vice Mayor of Berkeley, California. And um, so I, I am a politician, and I'm also an attorney and an impact investing professional. And my work has always centered on, uh, on finding new pathways to increase prosperity for those without it. And that is because uh, it is my family's mission. It's our core purpose. Uh, we fled slavery to come to Berkeley in the 1850s. And we came up very arduous, terrorizing, uh, <laughs> uh, colonial journey uh, through Canada down to Berkeley uh, with many fights along the way that we won every single one of them uh, because we knew even in times of bondage who we were that we were free and that colonialism was not for us so in Berkeley we set up shop and we had business at the Port of Oakland uh, we were involved in, uh, in leveraging change every step of the way um, we did the, the nation's um, first integrated YWCA we ended lynching in California uh, my grandfather's the first black realtor in Northern California, he and his partners uh, wrote the Fair Housing Act uh, to allow us to, to, to be accessing the power um, that comes from having a home, which is tremendous. Um, and, and so on and so on. And my mother, who was a founding member of the Black Panther Party, uh, pulled me out of the school where they were trying to colonize my young mind and went to the Black Panther School, where my training involved uh, learning the newspaper, the New York Times every day, and having to recite articles and explain the context of the news in terms of the system that uh, Daisy described so well, this, on, this ongoing concurrent colonialism and being able to see it and see it in larger context as a system and then to find the ways to break that system and create new ones. And so that was, that was my training from birth and that is uh, our mission. And <laughs> so I guess um, what brought me here is that mission has continued because recently um, we have discovered, um, well, Economists are saying that in, uh, in the next generation, a uh, majority of us, uh, when I say that I mean African Americans and Hispanic Americans, uh, are going to have a median worth of zero dollars. 
what? Wealth, worth, zero dollars, zero net worth, and a 15% literacy rate. So this is uh, what slavery was. This is the return of slavery. The day after Trump got elected, the private prison stocks went up, way up, because they saw it coming. And you know, every cap and gown that the kids wear when you go see your niece's graduation, every single cap and gown in the country is made in one prison in America, in South Carolina. This is the deal. And now, you go outside, you see homeless people. The tents. California has at least 150,000 people in the streets right now. In Berkeley, it's 1,400. So, my mission has been always to find new ways to break that future and make a new one. So, in impact investing, I work in renewable energy. I do things like repurpose steel factories around the country so workers from prison can go there and learn to make electric vehicle charging, sta charging stations and batteries. Uh, we deploy these new models to help save the environment and save people. <coughs> That's the wellness system, full, the full totality of wellness. And so I've been seeking every single way possible to do this. And so technology, which uh, I'm familiar with due to just my work life, I mean, from California, I've been around some tech. <laughs> um, when I first discovered the, the blockchain and the coins aspect, I immediately thought there was a way that we could give people the power over the electron. Because the electron is at once information, energy, and currency now. So if we could find a way to move, the, move that electron around people and around charging electricity and phones and cars and whatnot, maybe you could open up the ability for people to make money. And so I was thinking it through and thinking it through and then recently uh, had a breakthrough understanding of where we could go and we designed um, uh, an ICO for the city of Berkeley, which is purpose to prove out a larger context I call the smart path which leads us to solving for the zero, zero asset problem. Zero physical assets and zero financial assets. We're solving for both via these, these things we call micro bonds, which are coming out very soon this summer. So I'm here because Chelsea invited me, and I'm, I'm, I'm on tour right now uh, <laughs> speaking. Speaking Friends about the on smart tour, path. <laughs> <laughs> speaking about the smart path, everywhere I go, I've talked to 10,000 people so far in the last three weeks about it. Uh, because I am convinced that the blockchain is a tableau that we can write our future upon. And I also am convinced that momentum is not favoring the future that we want because I'm, I'm watching it slide. And so I'm, I'm determined to do all I can do, all my tactics, all my skills, all my connections to, to, to figure out a path forward that saves the future because you do not want to see the future they're promising us. Well said. You're doing a good job. <laughs> um, so I also wanted to mention why I find this topic valuable and significant. So my background, for those of you that don't know, is in the sharing economy for the last five years. I've been drawing out conversations of what is value and how might we distribute it and how might we actually share that value. And the sharing economy led me to a period of disillusionment because I felt like labor was being exploited and a number of other things were happening, hyper-efficiency over human interaction, things like that. Um, but I think blockchain brings a new potential for shared value and shared ownership, which I believe you're alluding to, right? Which is so important, it's so valuable in the future. Because if we're not sharing ownership now, in the future, there's gonna be a lot of people that don't have anything. And that's, that's, that's a big part of my, my own personal voyage and work. So with that, let's, let's kick off some questions. So Anastasia, yeah, we, um, we had a conversation maybe about a month and a half ago, and we sat down for coffee for maybe like 25 minutes. It was really quick. And she mentioned this, this topic of tech colonization. I was like, wait, what? Tell me more. And she's, she gave me some examples, and I was like, we need to tease this conversation out, and we need to, we need to develop a different story. So right. with that, yes. like, what are some of the things that we're not aware of or paying attention to that you're seeing? 
So probably it's not just me saying it, but um, maybe I'm just more sensitive to it. So I like to bring it up and say, hey, let's ask more questions than we actually do. And let's be conscious and think it through better than we did before. And we really need to learn from our past so we can move forward in the future. As Ben said, blockchain offers us amazing tools to actually create a more decentralized and an equalized future. But it's still us humans with a lot of biases, with a lot of intergenerational traumas that are writing the code, the smart contracts. We are coding our AI. We are writing the smart contracts and then self-execution and then probably we're going to have AI who are coding the AI. We must stop and just really focus on what we want the future to look like. Do you want it a, an, another black episode mirror? <laughs> and it's already happening in China and somewhere here in Silicon Valley too. But um, Or do we want it to, you know, we have the chance now to make it right. And we really have to focus on self-sovereignty. We really have to focus on our personal lives and data and our knowledge and how we share it and not go the same approach from up to um, down and say, oh, I brought you. It's the charity approach. I brought you the tech. Uh, scan your eyes, your fingers, give me your identity, I'll sell it later for the government and so on. No, we what? can't do that anymore. But the, the example that you mentioned when we chatted was the refugees, yeah? Yes, yes, that's, that's happening a lot in the refugee space. So uh, the whole blockchain is full of um, projects that want a lot of attention, right? So they fight for attention. So blockchain to combat children trafficking, blockchain to combat refugees uh, migration, blockchain for tummy aches and so on. It's, it's not okay. Right? It is happening now. So no, no, why, I say, <laughs> why I say that is because how we do things is essential. So um, I need, I, I'm going to run a very, very quick experiment, like 30 seconds. I need a volunteer, somebody who I don't know, who is not a friend of mine from the audience, come here for 30 seconds. Uh, I know half of the audience, so just <laughs> come. Okay, good. So. <laughs> Just let, let's turn. So why I say that is um, it's going to be an example of extremes, but it really sticks with people. And next time when you make a decision, think about how, how you made the decision and what is your message, what is your intention, and how you actually deliver it. Okay? So you're powerful. You're beautiful. Don't you ever dare to dump yourself. Yeah, how, how did it make you feel? How did it make you feel? Uh, it was kind of, uh, what's the word? Oppressive. <laughs> Aggressive. Yeah, so if I say the same thing like that, you're beautiful and powerful, and don't you ever much dare to better. dump yourself. Much, right? much better. See, much so better. those are two extremes. Thank you. So when, when I do this experiment, I always... <laughs> I always fear I'm going to be punched, you know, because I invade people's <laughs> personal space. Uh, thank you. So <laughs> that's a simple but very clear example of what we do and how we do matters. Yeah. Uh, and when I talk about blockchain and technology, this is what we Where do. Where that nose we go? go to <laughs> Can we bring that back oh, out? Yeah, always, always. <laughs> there you go. Are you going to take me? Are you going to take me seriously? Yeah. Uh, so in blockchain, what is happening now is very little people have the knowledge. And actually, if you look at how much a senior engineer is paid, uh, um, structural engineer, is is amazing. It, Saya, you were saying that. Oh yeah, I saw a position for a blockchain programmer for seven hundred ninety thousand dollars. And it's Woo! normal. It's normal. Okay. So really, how many of us has Ha have this knowledge or access to knowledge to make that kind of money. So these people are writing our future. And those are elite, yeah? And c going back to Saya's point that 
who is in the room is going to be the winner. But we can't function anymore like that because mothers are going to be always excluded. Disabled people are going to be always excluded, indigenous and so on. And we are a society, we don't operate alone. It always comes back to us. So I was thinking, man, we're really going to, we, we have to do something. And the proposal as well for today, today's talk, is to come up with a couple of points that we can bring it in our life and actually um, execute on them, you know, when, when we make big decisions or even when we work on the street, check in and think, hey, am I biased? Am I doing that because I'm conditioned and so on, right? We would love to have a little, uh, to deliver to you a little toolbox and please when, when uh, we open the discussion, come up, you know, give us ideas, and we're happy to listen. Thank you, was it too long? No, that was, that was indescribable. <laughs> Thank you. So I, uh, no, you're, yeah, you, you'll always be remembered. <laughs> Saya, so um, what are some negative things that you think could come about with blockchain technology? I know you've written a lot about this, so I'd love to hear. Things that can occur with anything. To, to kind of like riff off what you were saying, one way I like to think about um, the power of the, the designer is uh, sex dolls. If you look at the majority of all sex dolls, they're women and they all look very specific. They have a very specific body type, certain thing, and it's created in the eye of the beholder. It's created because most of the designers have a perception of what women should be like and you know, like what a sexual relationship with a woman would be like. And so that's just like one very classic example of um, how the person at, you know, behind the wheels can really determine, like if, Sorry to bring back this uh, analogy with sex dolls, but if sex dolls become the norm, it's become a norm because they were put there in the first place and people adopted them. So in the same way, um, blockchain is similar, is that on one hand, you have extremely talented people with these visions, which um, to be fair is very valid because everyone has different perspectives, but at the same time, uh, those visions can be very exclusionary. And what that means is like you, you might think that you're doing something greater for the world, but to what extent are you really understand how this impacts people on the like personal level, on the peer-to-peer -peer level? And uh, just before, um, just having a great conversation with somebody that I met tonight about uh, just bureaucratic systems, like the UN, for example, they will come in and they will say, we have a vision for how we can change this country's uh, refugee crisis or this country's uh, child hunger. And they often will have these visions, these plans, but people making the policies, people making the plans often are not the ones in the field, right? And because it's just a scalability issue. Like, you're not going to be so close, but how do you, like, so, like, so much of information is always passed on differently that there's this big gap between what is actually happening on the grounds and what people need versus who is creating what, you know, they believe the world needs. And when this happens on a, you know, two, three person level, it's very easy to say, okay, like, no, I, that's not right. But as you scale, scaling is such a big part of our, the, the tech movement right now that once it gets to certain people that you can't control information, you can't, it's like, it has to be autonomous. That's when it starts getting difficult because you can't make those changes, right? People are like, oh, you know, I don't like the experience of this store because it makes me feel that they're not considering my needs. Well, that has to move up a certain ladder. That has to move to a certain priority level for people to change that. And so that's the big gap. Like when we talk about, like when I talk about accessibility, it's that there is this inaccessibility for change. Um, and so it's twofold. Like people coming in, designing, they will set something, but people who are negatively affected by it, they can't change it. So all of a sudden, there's a system in place that gets stronger as you as time passes and it's just becomes so harder so much harder to revert and so that's one of the negative things that i can see the um, blockchain 
potentially like causing. Like the internet was supposed to be the great equalizer, and the the gap, the wealth gap, has gone uh, has gone much bigger since the 90s because of the internet. And so, will blockchain like increase that gap, or will it decrease it? Um, it'll be very interesting to see. But I think that's why we're all here to talk about it because it's not something that changes overnight, but it does change by like having these conversations and understanding what responsibilities we all have. So, Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Questions in a moment. We'll do that in a moment, I promise you guys. Otherwise, it just gets really choppy. Um, so a question for all of you. And then I have a question for you, Ben, to bring it back in. Um, so what value, so we're, we're talking, we're having this conversation about, you know, what's wrong? What are all the things? What's happened in the past? How do we write a new story? But how do we, like, what values do we want to codify and program into the future? And how do we think about these not just now, but in 10 years? Like, what's the difference between what a technology enables in terms of, value and what our values are and what we want to generate and how things are actually going to change along with that. I mean, I know that's a very loaded, extensive question, <laughs> but uh, we've gotten that, into it this deep, yeah, yeah. so let's We're do it. Here, so, let's yeah. go down the line either way. Well, uh, I think we need to definitely, um, you know, in, encode our, our tools with our spirit, right, our, high, our higher spirit. Um, you know, tools were all, so the, the, the very notion of tools was meant to extend our power, extend our reach, and extend our ability to express ourselves, right? Whether it's a spear or a microphone or what have you. So, you know, this, this technology, you know, and I think when it's at its best, it's doing that. Um, you know, so if we can just, you know, make certain that the technology provides a way to amplify the part that makes life worth living for people, uh, then we've done something. And I think there's a real potential um, for AI to be done the right way. You know, I, I think a lot about the, the bots, the little, the little the bots that work for us, that will be working for us, uh, as, as physical jobs co sort of are eroding and disappearing due to technology, I believe they're gonna be replaced in a certain mesof mesosphere type of environment where bots will be working for us. And those bots can defend you. And the system you're talking about here where you're locked in a, in a smart contract unbreakable algorithm where you're trapped in hell at this this terrible store experience your bot should be able to work on that you know we have to have the power to to be able to change systems and you know incorporating a flexibility as you said and uh, incorporating um, the need to have uh, togetherness right so you see that happening a bit with the consensus approach to what's happening right through the blockchain if we can keep the consensus dynamic flowing we'll approach togetherness Consensus yes, as the but, company but see, or consensus, no, 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 consensus like as, as a framework? A, as a framework. Well, I mean the framework. Okay. Framework. Yeah, you know. But see, Ben, again, we have <laughs> here. No, no offense to consensus here in the room. I mean the, the, the We're the, the talking share. again about 1% of the people who actually have access to a computer, who actually know about blockchain, who actually can uh, open a wallet. So how many of you here ha have an online all like crypto wallet? Okay, half. Okay, and we're in San Francisco, and San Francisco is in, in Silicon Valley, and it's a bubble in a bubble, and we're super educated, we're talking about tech colonization, and still not everybody has a crypto wallet. Why? Because it's difficult. Why? Because it requires resources. So yes, I agree with you, we have to code our um, higher selves and aspirations, but as well, we are not there yet, because we didn't deliver the technology to everybody. We really need to inform people, to educate, and then, only then, say, hey, we're going to come with a code of ethics with everybody in the room. We're going to co-create them, not say, oh, Anastasia, she's so smart, she's going to write them. No, that's n never going to work, you see? And we don't know enough yet about the technology. We don't know how to really operate it. We have to imagine a lot of different scenarios. But why not inviting people at the table and co-create them? That's what I'm saying. And when we go on in the Philippines and say, oh, I'm going to work the, with the government to create, what were they creating? 
I'm not going to make names of the, 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 the big company that is doing that. So they, they basically went there, uh, legally bribed the government and say, said, oh, yeah, you have the drug problem, so we're going to do something on the blockchain to prevent that. Total nonsense, but <laughs> they have the money. They want to go in these markets and explore, right? How is not that tech colonization at the purest? It is. And there are big companies that are working in the blockchain that are doing that again. So it's not okay, right? But, uh, yeah, I, I got carried on. Well, I agree I, with you on the values, but you, we have as well a lot of biases, for example. Right. Well, Do I'm, we I'm want not, to quote that I'm in there? Limiting, I'm not limiting values going to the blockchain. I mean through everything we do. And right. if it's focused on you know, making fundamentals of togetherness work so everyone eats, everyone has clean water, mm -hmm. everyone has clean air, you know, everyone has shelter. Right. You know, as, we, as we develop our technologies, uh, you know, they should be reflective of our higher aspirations, whatever they are. Blockchain is just one thing. Right, right, but yeah. But blockchain can't desalinate water and mm -hmm. save South Africa and Pakistan and Australia mm -hmm. from, from drying out. Right. That's, that's hard technology. Mm -hmm. We need to make that too. Mm -hmm. And right now the resources are not directed for the people because the, the prosperous ones do not believe everyone else is with them or deserves to be with them. So when we, when we tackle the belief nature, uh, rather the lack of belief in togetherness, uh, then everything will flow the right way, whether it's AI, whether it's, you know, whatever. So yeah. don't limit yourself. And to kind of like add on to that, I think it's the idea of um, perceiving, I think a lot of people tend to struggle with self-preservation, this need of moving yourself forward to, for the sake of, I don't know, your career or the business or whatever. And that's naturally a part of human behavior, but it's sort of thinking about how there is no way that monopolies can work. If a monopoly works, it means that a system is broken. And it's kind of bringing pluralism back, um, which is kind of sort of what you're saying. It's like everyone needs to be present in that value system in order for an actual like value to arise. It's sort of a, when these tech companies come in and they're like, okay, we are going to solve education and one company will like solve education. That doesn't work because as soon as that happens, you have one system for the diversity, the complexity, the chaos that is humankind and all the different histories, all the different backgrounds. It's so colorful. It's so different. And yeah, maybe somebody, you know, who is in, Sri Lanka will not have the same history as somebody who is in Greece, who is in like Brazil, and that's okay. And recognizing that and understanding that all of those lines like uh, matter, and then like coming from that point of okay, now when that happens, how do we start to have a conversation around like it's not really about you know it's not really about like you moving forward, but it's also like bringing in all these different dialogues into the narrative and allowing people to then like co-create and co-construct and it's very hard it's so much easier it's so easy for me to sit here and be like this is yes, ideal standardization is just so much easier and faster right right but that's where our society is broken because if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far go together right it's an african proverb and that is the truth if we want to do something alone and do the standard approach we're gonna go fast, wait, wait, wait. but we're gonna get stuck anyways. How do we how do we go together? Hey, can I jump in for one second? Um, Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so, I wanna thank my team that I came with. Uh, tonight I wanna thank Daisy, wherever you went for your uh, my name is Chikadi. Uh, my family is also from Nigeria. Uh, so the legacy of colonialism, uh, my, so my, my dad fought in the Biafran War. They were on the losing side. Uh, a million people died in that war. My grandfather's family was slaughtered in the Holocaust. So, you know, talking about intergenerational trauma and all that, you know, we're all living it in different ways. Um, but, you know, you were asking, you were talking about colonization. You're also asking, how do we go forward? So I want to invite you, if you're going to Blockchain Week uh, in New York in a couple weeks, I'm extremely, extremely proud of what we're doing as a team. Uh, we are, um, I'm the Clemter. 
Uh, we are throwing an event at the Bushwick Generator. Uh, we don't have the exact title, but we are bringing in NYC Together, which is an uh, organization that interrupts the school to prison pipeline. Uh, we are going to be having our CTO, who's 21 and brilliant, he's going to be teaching about smart contracts. Uh, so we're going to have room for maybe 150 we high school have students. We do solutions that are kind of come at yeah. the end. So we're and doing I'm, something. Okay. I'm very proud of it. Right. So I just wanted to <laughs> invite you. Uh, I, can, I can share it with you on email. I just wanted to uh, uh, add to the conversation that things are happening, and we invite you to participate. So uh, I just wanted to, you know, because we have plans, but uh, I wanted to make sure that there are things that are happening, and it's important that they're shared. So I just wanted to... Right, yeah. While, well, while, there are while, things while that are happening. Bubbling, and I wanted to throw that in there. So. I don't want to be the pessimist who cries, you know, oh, I'm so sorry, everything is bad. No, there are solutions. I know solutions. Thank you very much for bringing that up. And I know Daisy, I don't know where she is. Yeah, I she think... was a part of, um, two weeks ago, the coding week for women, and they were learning about blockchain and smart contracts, and that's amazing. It is happening. So at the end, we're going to you know, do a toolbox and, and talk about that more. But yeah. I really want to ask the questions, like why are we doing it? Are we doing it right? Where do we want to go? And so then come up with answers. Definitely. And sometimes like, in the midst of sitting with stuff, it's a little bit uncomfortable in the, like, what are the problems? And it seems pessimistic, but it's definitely not meant to be. It's just meant to be like, hey, let's, let's address what's here, and then let's find ways to move forward. So one of the things that's meant to come out of this event is a one-pager that's three things that we can do to be mindful now in the future of not being colonizing in technology or in blockchain technology in general. And I'm happy to take more comments and questions in a little bit, like maybe in like five or six minutes. <laughs> but yeah, I want to keep the conversation and dialogue going. So uh, with that, Ben, how are you thinking about blockchain in terms of government and governance? And how do you see the role of government evolving in the future? New mic here. You know, it's a good point. Um, so I, I, I see the, uh, the the ledger technology um, as a mechanism uh, of, you know, of course, accountability, transparency, uh, streamlining processes. I mean, you know, government and like the other big bureaucratic systems is rife uh, with incumbency theft. You know, every step of the way, there's an incumbent force uh, impeding uh, movement, capturing value. For instance, we have a swimming pool. Uh, in, in my town, uh, we're trying to refurbish it. Uh, the cost is $30 million. Uh, so you know, I'm like, why does it cost that much? Is, is it the size of Manhattan? Um, and you know, so I think that you know, the, 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 the blockchain allows us to kind of uh, penetrate that, that mystery of where resources are going. Uh, but further, there's another element to it, um, which we're trying to explore myself right now. Uh, uh, my candidacy uh, for the state assembly, we're going to be offering uh, a token. It's like a smart token uh, to connect people to our issues, to one another, a whole platform uh, that can help decide how to vote on things, suggest, suggest uh, procedures, suggest topics to vote on. Uh, you know, and this, I think, is meant to kind of introduce the idea of a more robust democracy, um, a more interactive democracy, uh, one that, again, uh, can, can penetrate the, the, the curtain of the, of the incumbency powers, the lobbyists, the corporations, everyone else that, that are keeping you from expressing your will through your elected official. Uh, and I think if democracy is going to succeed, uh, it, will do, it will be because of things like this that the blockchain will enable. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so last question, maybe some just like final thoughts before we open it up to uh, more group discussion, but what do you, what do you want to see? What do you guys want to see in the future? Like what, yeah, like this, this question between, I'm going back to it again, but this question between what does the technology enable versus what do we want to see? What collective story do we want to be creating in the future? Yeah. Um, I, I think of the, about this twofold, actually. Like, one, there's my personal vision of that's not related to blockchain as, at, at all. Like, what do I want to see in the future? And that's actually, like, empowered people, right? When my mom tells, tells us to me all the time, she, her life philosophy, and I've adopted it too, is that 
if you're happy doing what you love and other people appreciate you for that, then maybe you're doing something good in the world. And so it's something that is just on its own, a, a life philosophy that I follow, but tactically speaking, like in the space that I am now, how does that actually look like? Well, it's also coming from like the more education side, like, okay, how do you get people through the funnel? How do you give them the tools, the resources for them to go from point A to the point B and then C to Z on their own? Um, and then at the same time, tactically, like it's like, for giving people resources is easy, but how do you also provide the actual like tools, the, the resources that allow people to then create their own systems, create like what they feel they need in order to do that. So like support them during the C to Z process as well. And so sort of understanding, you know, how do you create these multiple pathways, these pathways that maybe I don't even know myself, you know, just giving them these resources saying, okay, whether it's a wallet or whether it's, I don't know, uh, some sort of API or whether it's a handbook. These things can all be really powerful and valuable. So coming from that education designer lens, that's where I currently am. But the big vision is everyone in this room and everyone in this world can feel like they're doing what they love and everyone is like, great, you're awesome. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Thank you. Anastasia. Yeah, no, I, I agree on that. Empowerment and education are very strong. But what I really care and want to see coming in, in our lives more and more often is consciousness, mindfulness. Be mindful when we do something and really understand why we do that, where it's coming from. Is it from a past trauma? Is it from fear? Is it from love, acceptance? I really want to see not tolerance, I'm fed with tolerance, acceptance. Just say, it's all right, it's different, but it's all right, I accept it. That's something that I don't see yet. Because, oh yeah, I live there and here, but uh, I have some homeless people, you know, when we talk about it, like, and it bothers me. It's, it's there and it's, it's not okay. Uh, and then probably just, uh, being less judgmental and yeah but it comes with acceptance so I think mindfulness and acceptance is what I really really want to see and it's a difficult one I know but <laughs> that's my hope for the future thank you you know I want to see uh, this is what I tell kids all the time when I speak to schools uh, you know, there, there's, there, there's like, imagine a T. There, on one side, there's fate. Other side, there's destiny. And your fate is, you know, to be black skies and dirty oceans and, you know, dead environment, horrific abuse of humanity. And then, but your destiny is uh, what you achieve when, you, when you're on the mark and you found your voice and you go for it. And that's when you have, um, you know, the, the, the new markets, the clean economy, the wholeness, the wellness. You know, fate is what you're left with when you don't achieve your destiny. So I, I, I really want to see us achieve our destiny and avoid our fate. And so I'm super excited about, um, you know, the, the, the right value set emerging via smart contracts. So, I mean, right now the, the older generation is, pa is passing away and leaving untold billions of dollars to the next generation. And that is being combined with family offices from big tech millionaires and foundations and to, to the point where we're now at about $2 trillion of committed capital looking to invest in good new markets. And you see this with the carbon-free investments, conflict-free diamonds, things like that. It's, 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 it's your voice trying to be made manifest. It's happening. It's burgeoning. And so, you know, I'm really hoping that the technology can find a, a, a stream for that a path for that capital to flow through, where you can actually shift entire supply chains away from what we saw in the video there, the resource exploitation, and instead resource cultivation, and create a whole new economy with a halo and a gravitational effect that can pull everyone over and eventually you know, make this earth into a wonderful future place before we leave it. 
Mm. I just want to say, I love that. Achieve destiny, avoid fate. That's like, I'm going to put on a post. Solid. All right, you guys. You guys have questions. Let's get answers. All right, come up here. Do you know uh, a, a mic probably because we're yeah, also streaming? So it'll, be, that would help it'll be able very, very quick. Yeah. So when I was 12. Wait, no, wait, I, further back so they can see you. See this little eyeball? Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry that I have to leave because this is such a wonderful group. Um, but I, I just want to say that the process to do this happens with people like this and conversations like this. And it happens from taking conversations like this and turning them into action. And not only are there smart people in this room who have great ideas that are talking to each other about what the problems are and tactically looking at that, there are people here who are the founders of companies, who are the, the people who will build what could be the dynasties and imperialist entities of tomorrow. They could be the systems that from the ground up are built to help things. Um, so I, ju I just want to thank Chelsea for starting this conversation and for this group being here. So. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you guys. I'm hi. actually really hi. My name's Turn Alex. That way. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I'm work at a company called Orchid Labs in town. Um, you can look oh, us yeah. up at orchid.com. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm actually I'm an edu educator and entrepreneur, educator by background, so I really related, related with what you said. And I'm also excited about the guys doing the educational workshop at, in New York. Would love to learn more about that. Um, I'd love to know what you're actually doing in this space to help educate people who would not normally have access to, say, even knowing what a smart, you know, what a wallet is or a smart contract. So I would, if you could share a little more about the work you're doing, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. Um, on the content side, so I started writing on Medium, and I actually illustrate infographics that explain complex uh, subjects in a really simple way. So, for example, explaining blockchain via Google Docs. And Google Docs is also hard for some people, so sometimes I explain it through, like, ant farms. Um, an ant farm without its queen, or things like that. So uh, finding different ways to convey information, um, and, that, and part of that has led me to work with some blockchain companies to better explain their protocols, um, condense, uh, illustrate their white paper, do things like that. You know, how do you really lower the barrier to entry to information? So that's one side content-wise, um, writing about it. And sometimes not everyone is a visual learner, so uh, I don't create all the content, but like redirect uh, resources. I have a Telegram group. It's small. It's like 12 people, but it's just where I like post. All right. What's the name? <laughs> How do we find it? I can I can share with the group if you're interested. It's called Get it out. it's called Crypto AMAs, and it's just like people can ask any question, and it's just like sending resources, being like, here's a great way to learn about cryptocurrency. Here's a great way to learn about Gwei. GWEI, which is a smaller form of Ethereum. Anyway, it's very. There's a lot of jargon in the in the uh, in the industry in the space. Um, so that's one. And the other is I started working with this company that's working to support uh, DApp developers, um, decentralized application developers, and also uh, users because the experience to you know like download a wallet, do all that stuff is really complex. It's not for the mainstream user. So how do you buffer that experience? But also at the same time, there's not a lot of DAP developers in the space. And even then, there's a lot of pain points. How do you support them in the process? And so um, nothing out in public yet, but a lot of exciting stuff. So that's more of the practical, uh, technical side of how do you really support them um, through that process. So. I think it's very important as well to run workshops in the languages yeah. the people understand and not just in English. Because there is a lot of information in English, yep. but when I go back home, you know, they understand probably 60%, if, if 60, it's good. Uh, and they still don't have access to all of this information. So running workshops in the native language of the uh, country is very important not just go there with English and select people who speak English so you go there and preach to the choir again 
Yes, and on that note, the infographics that I made are actually open source. So there's a whole instruction. If you want to change it into a language of your choice, I can send over the file so that you can change the information. Um, I have a friend who's doing it to translate into Korean. Um, and so if you are interested, uh, that's really important as well. Not everyone speaks English. So. Yeah, Sai's work is amazing. I definitely encourage you all to look at it. Yeah. Wait. Did you want? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I know that we're talking about <laughs> solutions. I think one thing to realize is colonialism is based on the assumption that there's an other. Yeah. It's based on this. It's on othering. So I think for folks who are in the space, um, you need to think about how you other other people, right? And you need to look, check that when that othering comes up. Like, do you rationalize on other people's pain and oppression? Well, maybe he should have done this, or maybe she should have done that. And once you start there, um, I think it's going to be really easy for you to understand where the blind spots are. So something I learned at Standing Rock is this idea of calling someone out or inviting them in, which I really, really love, which is like, you did that, versus, hey, did you think about, like, that that might have hurt that person's feelings in that group and yeah. like pulling them aside and calling them into the circle versus like othering them out of it and being like, you're bad, you're wrong. Well, the other thing too though with that is that um, as sometimes asking questions to understand versus asking questions to get the answer, like oftentimes when we ask questions, we ask to clarify like, oh, I didn't understand that versus why did that person explain it that way? Like, to understand the other is a more powerful way to understand why anything is. And so sometimes, too, like in some instances, people won't invite you in the space and people won't call you out. And that's when it's also thinking about, well, how can I then better understand whether it's, you know, from afar or so? So. All right, we got a question over here. Yeah, so I have a couple of comments and then I have a question. So uh, you mentioned the, uh, the 90s and the internet was supposed to be the great equalizer, but then we didn't change the established infrastructure. So in, rather than you would think capitalism wants the best for everything along with the internet, would meant that more women would have gone into STEM, but no, it was the opposite where you were told you were not good at STEM. So it just established, made it even worse. I think blockchain in a different way, the fact that we're having these conversations, the fact that Telegram uh, pin notices get changed, translated in different languages. I think the fact that we're having talking about this is, is, I think it's a good start. It's not enough by itself, it's a good start. The second thing I think in terms of treating people, it's I always look at, look at how kids treat each other, babies. They don't know any different. They approach from a pure standpoint. So that should be what we aspire to, right? And then uh, the question I had was in terms of, uh, oh, uh, the other part, uh, to go with what Ben said was, I don't think it's one or the other, you have to do both. I don't think you can wait till everybody has a laptop before you can start to do some of these things. Maybe it's a Raspberry Pi, maybe it's a tablet, maybe it's someone to go to the education part. So it has to be both, you have to do both at the same time, you can't do one or the other. Uh, so in terms of education, there was a woman in blockchain event where I met Daisy actually. Um, they talked about it doesn't take very long these days to get certified in blockchain. There's a huge need for it. So what do you know or what are you guys doing, if you know any efforts to train people who are people of color or women or traditionally not uh, empowered to, to do this, especially since it doesn't seem like it would take that much time and that it would be, it's a huge need. Right. So personally, I do workshops where I know best. So it's in Republic of Moldova and Italy. And I actually wanted to uh, run a couple of summer schools in different parts of the world, but I'm not that familiar with. So I dropped the ball. I let our experts do that. Uh, and I think it's very important to, for, for each of us to do something. My profession is something different. I do that out of passion. That's my, my second startup. But um, that's what I do. And then I go to events, I speak about it. Awareness is extremely important. And talking about it, opening it up, and really stay vulnerable and take it in and say, hey, how can we make it different? Sorry, it's I'm important. Sure. But Does anyone know any training programs that are being set up to do training people? Here, you mean? Here in... in uh, globally, wherever, but go yeah, to sure. We're go to you I'm should happy do to it. share with you. Yes. <laughs> no, there, there, are, there are a lot of workshops already. 
I'm happy to in the toolbox okay. we're gonna do. I'm happy to share. Yes. Yeah, I know there are, there are groups. Okay. Yeah. As well here in the Bay Area, there are happening. Yeah. Just a side note though, like I've definitely seen people try to milk. Like they will sell two thousand dollar workshops or something you can learn. Yes, in, like, as well hours. online or yes, so, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Looks like we have a few more questions. Let's let's get it going on this side. All right, so two more. Hello, guys. My name is Felix, and I'm here representing an immigrant. I'm an alien, so what? I have no fear of saying that. And I have a question for you guys. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. So I'm very interested. I'm homeless. I'm not lazy. I'm interested in contributing to the world. I'm interested in learning about tech. And I, I've been researching about courses. To, to, to learn tech and to, to contribute to the world. And I had to lie that I'm an American citizen, but they caught me in a lie. So I have a question for you guys. What can we do for, for, for ending the colonialism, like she said? Because I want to learn something. Me, I represent, not, it's not just me here. There's a lot of immigrants wanting to learn and want to integrate in a society. So that's my question for you. If I would appreciate if you can, someone can answer and take action for this. Thank you. Well, I'm an immigrant. I'm a triple immigrant. No, no, uh, no, yeah, and I so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not judging. I'm just, I'm, uh, I'm, so I don't feel judged, absolutely. Yeah. I'm just trying to tell you, you know, there are a lot of ways to get around to learn. Uh, definitely YouTube is a good place to learn. And then if you want to learn more and get specialized in something, uh, I'm happy to share with you. It's 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 fine. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, the, the question be well, the question was what? And, and I'm for, not an American citizen. No, well, I think it's important though to recognize that everyone comes from different levels and like it's like how do you yeah like what is the support system as well as like what is the resources that can also help anyone from any level and all of that and. Yeah, there's definitely, and I'm also happy to share, you know, things that might be helpful for you. But I think it's very. What would you like to learn so we know, like, what uh, what to share? Tech, technology, programming, coding, every, okay. all that. But not just me. I'm just not worried about me. I'm I'm worried about all of the others that don't have access to this. Well, oh, then that's the access to the system. That's much bigger. It's not just like learning. Well, yeah, so, so there, are, there, are, there are a number of ways for you to enter into the realm of knowledge. Uh, if you're here in San Francisco, the junior colleges are free. Um, and also, and, and in terms of what I think what you're really coming at, it was a deeper, more root issue, you're feeling the separation. You know, the, the current administration has really made a, made a, made a, a, a religious-style zeal around declaring our separateness. And I think you're feeling that. Um, you know, and there's a, there's a guy here in the room, James Hanusa, um, who is, uh, <laughs> he doesn't even look over here when who, he says <laughs> who is, his virtual reality um, <laughs> operation is. Is go, goes to deep, the, the deep psychological core of teaching you through VR and, and, uh, and augmented reality uh, to break down these false notions of separateness between people. So uh, there are a lot of people working to, 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 to get to the root of that deep, deeper issue which you're also getting at. But I think uh, you know, you're, a, you're a smart young man and I think uh, you just keep looking you'll find your way. Thank you. All right. Hey. Um, Hi. Never like asked a group a question like this. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I came. Great. Um, I came to this group because um, I uh, I don't know. I kind of recently came into this space. Um, I'm part of our. I have like a um, marketing and like branding company that works with um, blockchain companies, and uh, I don't know. We're recently sort of looking into partnerships for um, or ways to support. Um, like there are companies that are building things on the blockchain so my top priority i'm really involved in the queer arts community like the arts community in general like activism communities so um i was extremely um like hesitant to be involved in like you know cryptocurrency related things at all and had it evangelized me with all of this theory and i'm like that these are all the things we've been fighting for like this is amazing how is it happening and all the examples i have come across so far are 
like you know either people having a savior complex type scenario in terms of you know actually implementing the technology now not just selling this theory that's so exciting and like does not seem to be like actually being implemented um i, I don't know so i was just um i wanted to kind of hear from the community like what are ways that you know either um you know are about to be possible that like i could explore for how to um you know like support companies that like I just have not been able to find who you know maybe are starting to develop awesome things but don't have the infrastructure like um, you know I hear so many companies pitching their theory to me and I'm like I so what's the adore question? your theory. Um, what specific companies like could you connect me with or is there a like to do what to um, support? you want to support endeavors that like, are working. Fun. Or yeah, right. like I, like companies who are existing that could be part of our program that like we can help tangibly build right now that like need you know. What's your program? Yes. Um, so um, I'm getting and uh, well I don't know we're trying to start something with Starfish so it's the um, blockchain co-working space. So, yeah. Um, Starfish, you guys uh, check it out. It's a so, Yeah. So yeah, we're still figuring out exactly what that will be. So but I don't know. Me, like I come from a very different background and I'm trying to figure that so out. There so there is a yeah. long mm. list of amazing startups that do social good <coughs> using blockchain. Happy to share with you. Yes, that is exactly uh, what I mean. And then you about. can fish yes. out who are, which ones are based here in the Valley or in, in San Francisco and that probably will That would be amazing. It. Yeah, yeah. Because, okay. yeah, just, I don't know, cutting through like right. the chaff has just been, you know, there's a lot of companies that like say that they are going to do something and are not. But they are not. Something. Yes, that's why we're so, having awesome. this talk tonight. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Cool. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I didn't yeah. mean to have this be like such a public statement. Um, no, that's, that's great. great. Yeah, that's great. So, um, I also want to appreciate everyone who's asking questions I think and I like the fact that I'm here speaking is very surprising but um, I think it's yeah often hard to come up and ask questions so I also want to acknowledge everyone and thank you for like asking these questions and you know I think it's really important so and I also have a cool art project uh, blockchain art project that maybe you're interested um, in. I would love to hear about that yeah. and also the reason why I like came up to say this instead of just like asking you guys after is I just wanted to say that the other reason that I decided to come in terms of you know cutting through all the chaff and being like there's a lot of meetups is it seemed like a place where it would not be okay to interrupt women to say your um, you know your thing and I, I don't know I yeah, yeah. I think so that's I'm awesome that's yeah thanks for being here I'm glad you're that. perfect thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Also, because like oftentimes panels, they tend to be so rigid. Like right, there is yeah. this realm and then that realm, which like I personally don't yeah. like as. That well. was our goal initially to open the conversation as much as possible. But then we thought now it's going to be too chaotic, so we still decided to do it at the end. But yes, pass the mic. So. Some of it still happened in the middle. All right. All right. Uh, <laughs> thanks, guys, as well. Uh, my question, um, my background is also a little bit different. So my name is Senta. I work for one of the big tech companies uh, here in the Bay Area. Originally came from Ethiopia. So education is slightly different and I'm talking about the good part of blockchain that I want to address to, to you as a question. So in Ethiopia when I, was under, when, I, when I was learning, I was learning books that were 10 years old. Basically outdated technology when I was doing undergrad. Then I went for postgrad studies, and then you are actually studying. I did an MBA in China, and you are doing case studies. What's happening right now? And I came to San Francisco, and I'm actually lucky enough to be here to listen what's happening in blockchain and what you are trying to do in the future. So the question is, you know, for example, uh, the people that you want to teach to make blockchain good for uh, in Nairobi, there's M-Pesa. They didn't d develop credit cards. They actually used SMS to actually trans trans transfer money. So the contracts the, uh, on blockchain, the smart contracts that you want to create, how are you going to make sure that the ones that are not uh, knowledgeable enough are actually going to be using it? Because the people who are coding it, the use cases that are being done, are here, not with insight in terms of the, other, the rest of the world. So what are the use cases that you are working for? the good part of blockchain or at least what So there know. is already M, uh, BitPesa on top of M-Pesa. Yeah, I know that company as well. And yeah, and um, the two ladies, the co-founders, they, from Berkeley, they actually went, they, w they went back to Africa okay. and they co-designed it to meet the needs 
of the people on the ground. So that's a real example of uh, good tech, right, of co-designing process and having a product that actually serves the needs. And in terms of how you teach people, it's what Sai and I was saying, to translate it in their language so they really understand it and make it as accessible as possible. Uh, while we get there, we can't just sit in our ivory tower and say, oh no, everything is terrible, no. Uh, we still bring awareness here, we talk about it, we open doors, we open minds, and we stay focused on do, uh, do something better. I also think uh, Ben's a great person to answer this question because the idea of like, you know, assuming that not everyone will be experts, like what are some of the things that you are thinking? You're right, I could answer this. Uh, <laughs> FYI, we have five minutes okay. left, so, so I'll, just I'll be like brief. a time check. So, uh, you know, so my, my hometown, Berkeley, uh, provides many lessons, I think, for the universe, uh, including universal design. So this is where you uh, design the layout of the physical environment for everyone, whether you're in a wheelchair or a cane or you can walk. That's where curb cuts come from, the ramps upstairs. You know, they found that people like walking up ramps a lot more than walking upstairs. So shocking, you know, it's shocking your knees. So uh, I guess to, 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 to bridge what you're saying here, uh, one, one way to do this is to design for everyone because, you know, ultimately we will find that common language again. We had it once before and we lost it. Graphic language re-emerging, re right? That's the... Uh, that's the, uh, the, the little things, the, you know, the things in your phone, the smiley face and whatnot. Emojis. Emojis. Oh, yeah. you know, so we're coming, back, we're coming back to a common root language that we can express. So things we design uh, to be used can incorporate this universal design, this emerging common human language to be accessible to anyone no matter where you are. Cool. One last question, I think a comment? Or is it a question also? It's a question. Either way, we just we just want to wrap up so there's time to have a drink together and have conversations with each other. So let's just keep that in mind. Hi everybody. Um, my name is Victor Cooker. Hey um, Victor. I'm from West Africa, and uh, I want to thank everybody, um, especially the panel, for some light that you've shed We're on. West Africa. In, uh, I'm from Suriname, but I grew up in Ghana, so I'm I'm basically Ghanaian. Um, Daisy, I thank you for giving me a lot of education on myself. Mm. Growing up there, I only knew that shit was broken, and <laughs> I didn't really understand the systems propagating it. So thank you very much for some of the insight. Yeah. Um, I, I have a small startup with a co-founder called Shikapa, and what we set out to do in 2014 was change the lives of people who are trying to get an education, because there is a big problem with people trying to um, pay for their education and we wanted to set up an easier route for getting money to the schools so that they could establish trust between uh, payers and, uh, and the institutions so a wallet um, is what we came up with. Whilst we were doing this we were approached by many K-12 institutions around the rural areas that they needed a more um, they needed a more efficiency in their operations because they spend all the time chasing people for payments, you know, writing out things by hand. So we decided to try and help them with uh, profiles for kids' grades and uh, ad, um, um, admissions, you know, basically building an education, ed educational record where the, the, the students would actually have the power to share it with who they wanted to. So I heard about blockchain and I started learning about the Hyperledger and how I think it tr has tremendous tremendous um, opportunity to accelerate what we started doing in 2014. Uh, my question to you is around what you guys started talking about today. And I think we came up with a point where we spoke about ethics and how you are very conscious about the bias that there is in, um, in establishing some of these, these uh, technologies to help people like, like, like we're trying to do. Um, we are I want to say we, I represent a generation in, in Africa that is hungry for technology, hungry to be empowered, and hungry to be in control of how we do that. However, um, from your own experience, 
there, uh, for, uh, there, there, I was trying to, see, I was, I want to solicit any kind of advice as far as incentivizing people to use the technology. And the reason why I'm saying this is because um, even though there are all these things that we need to be cautious about, we realize that there are easier ways to do things, right? However, the incentives around technology are never clear and it's hard to communicate. So I was wondering if you could, you know, drop some knowledge on me. So what, what's the question? Can you phrase it in just like one So So I, I, I can uh, answer can that you? question, yeah. So I think you're asking like, how do you incentivize people to want to learn for the change, for a change in their own lives, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Okay. I think, and this might be a really good way to close and top if anyone has anything to add to, but the biggest thing is always ask, like, always wondering why you're learning anything, right? The important thing is for your students or whoever it is, um, why do we have to do this? Like, what is this for? And maybe it's the assumption that, oh, you believe that it's a better future for them, but maybe they will believe another thing. They, maybe there'll be another reason why, or maybe they won't even have a why. So it might even be getting them to asking why in the first place. Yeah. So I think that's a really like strong way to anchor, a very simple but strong way to help change like uh, perspectives. In fact, the, the problem is some of them are thinking about I'm hungry today, you know. So right. Um, exactly. So this is uh, exactly what um, we spoke about last week at this big healthcare conference uh, from a room of about 800 people. Um, they're trying to change behavior for you know, preventative medicine. Um, so I think really that the, so if, you, if you dig deep into this concept around token economics, this is why, one other reason why I love uh, the blockchain, the token economics. So the, the reason Happy why hour. The, the the reason why this is an value points for everyone on the chain. It's an ecosystem essentially. Yeah. Yeah. So so in terms of it getting people to shipping them, yeah. who are, have money going in and out of places, you know, schools and money. Maybe there's a way to pay that person. Yeah, so that's where you're going to get. All right, it has to be super quick. Supporter of, friend, woman that came with love. I'm sorry they entered late. Um, so, Digital Rain, we're always searching for um, solutions that unfuck the world. Um, and uh, we're looking at that in Puerto Rico, we're looking at that, or assembling in, at the Esalen Institute. Question to the panel is what's the best example in the blockchain crypto realm of something that unfucks the world? <laughs> uh, the great, so, un the great unsucking. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> um, I I don't have startups that do that on top of my mind, even though I know hundreds of them. But uh, probably processes like decentralized IT, self sovereignty that empowers a lot, that gives us back our own values that are our data and what we do. I think that's extremely important. And if we use it right and we're like really um, implement it, then it, it can bring a lot of value. But I don't see much yet. Because it's very experimental, the, 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 the space. And again, blockchain is such a hype now. We still don't have the nose to run uh, the, the transactions we want. And I can go very geeky and techy on you and, <laughs> and tell you why it's not Yet, uh, there, the tech is not as powerful as we think. I mean, it has the meaning, and probably it will get there, but still, it's very slow for now. Uh, so to unfuck the world, probably like to give back us our own self-sovereignty and data, and there are like DIDs, DOCs as well. 
So I would say shared power and shared ownership. And even in the form of power, there's a, there's a number of solar power companies that are blockchain enabled that are enabling people to share power in their own neighborhoods on their own grids instead of having to go back to the main power grid and be resold back or even you know non-distributed. So that's just an example of your own self-sovereignty, your neighborhood sovereignty, your community sovereignty of having access to the things that already belong to you and the resources that you were born into on this planet. So, yeah. I got one. I just read this article about the uh, refugee camp, Syrian refugee camp in Jordan. We're actually using blockchain. This it was an example of a guy with a black sweater talks and he's walking in and scans his retina and gives him all the stuff. It's all in the blockchain because they were finding the UN was trying to they collected money for these camps, but it was costing so much going through banks, fees, things like that. All that's gone. And also a lot of these people left their homes without any IDs or anything. They had the money to save their lives. So now if we restart their lives, they're saying this could be a way to start. Well, attention how they do this. So yes, blockchain has the potential to do that, but we really have to be... I know, I know exactly what you're talking okay. about. Uh, and I know the company. So the thing how they do it matters. If I own my private key and, the, and I know who has the public key and everything is ran smoothly, okay. Right. But if the government owns my data, that's even worse, right. and especially if I'm a refugee, Ooh. No, absolutely, yeah. Right? So careful when we talk about big projects coming, again, on people that don't really understand what is happening. I'm, that's why I'm talking here tonight, because UN is not all that fluffy and beautiful oh, as no, I'm not it, it, right. it might appear. We're doing some good right now. Uh, I have my doubts. Okay. Uh, real quickly, yeah, I, I have a company that I, that I like a lot. I think they're, make, they're moving the ball. Uh, I think they're called BuildCoin, buildcoin.org. Uh, they've cracked the code on infrastructure development, creating an ecosystem around the work for it, uh, decentralizing and breaking down the feasibility process, which, which crowds out uh, the ability to make you know, projects happen. I'm talking about water and, and land and food and, and building things to make life livable. Uh, check them out. We saw them at that at David Ellison's event, the Blockchain Society event. I'm really excited about them. Build coin. Or build ICO or something else. Oh, um, yeah. There. I feel like uh, I'm excited for quarter three of this year because I feel like that's when a lot of like blockchain DApps that have promised something are going to emerge, and it'll be interesting to see. You know how much it's easy to be excited for something but hard to tell until it's actually being like shipped and executed um so i guess i can't give one company now but i think the at the end of the day it's it's not only the company but the people like how people use it um you know you could have this amazing like potential for this technology and then the people who jump on board might have different intentions, and that could totally throw it off the wrong way as well. So, uh, yeah, like, but just in terms of domain, like land registry and just um, yeah. land rights, and also uh, things that require, sure. yeah, that have a lot more uh, bureaucracy involved, mm -hmm. is interesting. Amazing. Thank you all so much for this beautiful conversation. Thank you. Um, it looks like there's some more beer and wine left. Please stick around and have a chat for about 15 minutes. And yeah, enjoy your evening. Thanks so much for being here.